Hello, this is Calder, and this is, I think now, 8 day? I think it was, yeah, 8 day. Uh, IAE 29.52. Today it is, of course, Musashi Industrial and Starflight Concern, more commonly known as MISC. And MISC is one of the more interesting manufacturers out there, in my opinion. They have some really nice ships, some ones that are a bit like, eh. But overall, their lineup is fairly, fairly strong. And it's also one of the lineups that's, of course, not very much focused around combat. So that's always nice to have. Now let's start it as always with the lovely display and we'll start with the hollow suites on the left. Um, down there we have the Racer series, so if we want uh, small ships. Uh, Racer of course being racing ships, uh, they come of course in the standard Racer version, the, a stealth version, I don't know why you want a racing stealth ship, but sure there are reasons. And the luxury version, which is my personal favorite. And the reason being it's the type of ship that you buy when you have like, I don't know, an 890 to park it inside of. Because, well, it's a bit of a show-off ship. It's, uh, like, it's one of those ships like that's the, like people that are buying like supercars and stuff like that. Most of them will never drive them fast. But they want to have the car that can do it. So when it comes to racing ships, they are of course relatively expensive. But it is a unique role. And as I said, right now we don't know where the flight model where it's going. So just buy whichever one you think looks the best and you can always change things over later then we have in the uh hollow suite section we have the endeavor now that's of course the large science ship and i think this is one of the most still one of the most interesting concepts that it still needs to be fully developed and it will probably take a while longer but i will think it's one of the most powerful ships in the game for a lot of people whether you're on the whichever side of the law you're actually on because it can really act as a mobile base of operations in many ways. Yes, it is not a carrier, but it can support you with, uh, through medical uh, facilities, through being able to grow food, re refueling, and all of those things. So there's a lot to be said for the Endeavor when it comes to being a support ship. And of course, as being a large science and exploration ship, like it's not the ship that will map the jump point. But it is a ship that will just map a system in probably far greater detail than the other explorers will ever do. So in that regards, a very interesting ship. Um, still at a fairly decent price, even when you include the bunch of the modules, and definitely a recommendation. Then the Expanse. Now I have to be very honest, I completely forgot which ship that was. So let's go ahead and take a quick ender. Ah, that's the um, refinery ship. Yeah, mobile refinery. Probably will have a good use for a smaller level organization. So if you're mining out there with the prospectors and the moles, this is a ship that can definitely enhance the operation by reducing your logistical strain. Of course, if you're mining in really larger uh, amounts, you probably have uh, better options to suit yourself, but probably anywhere up to maybe even a mid-level organization could definitely make use of it. That said, it is a very singular purpose vessel. However, the price point, it is not too bad at $150. Then the Odyssey, of course, Misk's exploration ship and uh, infamous or famous character killer, the way you want to look at it. I personally really like it. Uh, I have one, but it is a really, really pricey ship. And being an exploration ship, it actually lacks a little bit more of the flexibility that I find that a carrot holds, but we'll really have to see when it comes out. Uh, the mining has been confirmed, I believe, so far that it's only capable of mining containium. Now, that of course may seem like, oh, that's fairly limited, but then again, it's not a mining ship. And being able to mine and refine containium means that it has an almost indefinite range, as long as, you know, your components hold out and you have enough uh, food stocked on board. I assume that water you can replenish through other means as well. So yeah, as an exploration ship, I think it is really cool, but the price is steep. It's uh, more expensive than the Carrick, which of course they've done on purpose, let's be honest here. But I think capability-wise, the Carrick uh, definitely right now wins out, so something to keep in mind, but I believe the loaner for the Odyssey is going to be a Carrick, so if you really like the idea of the Odyssey, by all means, get the Odyssey and you'll just have a Carrick to play around with. And finally, we have the hull series, and the hull series, of course, are the kings of cargo hauling. Uh, especially the larger versions are going to be immensely useful for just the bulk cargo transport that's going to be needed throughout the first all the time. So whether you're taking contracts or whether you're doing something for your organization. 
Then we have the Freelancer series, one of my favorite uh, ships when it just comes to raw capabilities. Yes, they're not the nicest flying, they don't have the best cockpit view, and the design is a give or take depending on what you, how you look at them. But they have a really nice capability package. That said, of the Ford, I can definitely say avoid the Dur. I don't see it being all that amazing. Some people say like maybe with exploration on smaller jump points. But right now, uh, I'm, I think there's just so much focus on exploration, but I haven't seen enough gameplay for it to say like you can buy that. The standard Freelancer, uh, the Freelancer Max, uh, great cargo holders. Freelancer Max, of course, a lot more cargo. But then the Freelancer is a little bit smaller, a little bit flexible when it comes to maybe getting into a fight. And then, of course, you have to miss, which is just like lobbing a lot of missiles around the place, which is very useful, um, both in an escort configuration and also in an uh, offensive uh, fleet scenario. Having a ship like this in a smaller fleet can actually make quite an impact simply by the volume of missiles you can put out there. And missiles gain more strength in the volume, and especially when they've reworked the countermeasures properly. So you can be continuously keeping on pressure upon a lot of targets. So I can see that being a very powerful option. In the center, we have the Prospector. Uh, of course, a single person mining ship. It is going to be always a good one to have. Especially if you're flying solo, but also in a smaller group, these things will have a lot of value. When you get to a medium-sized group, you're probably going to be looking more towards them all, just for that uh, next skill size upgrade. Hull series will already discussed. The smaller hull series to me are less interesting, because I think the other there are other ships out there that honestly are more interesting in that role uh, than I would say than the smaller hull, but they're definitely still a decent buy. Then we have the Starfarer, I mean that ship is in desperate, desperate need for a complete overhaul when it comes to the interior. But of course being a uh, refueling vessel it is going to be absolutely important for uh, larger operations. Like this allows you to keep ships on station so they don't need to go back and refuel. If you're going to have of course access to ships like a Kraken then of course when it comes to the medium sized ships that no longer becomes a point really but the software i can also see being very useful and even at very large scales because these are probably the ships you will use maybe to refuel a for example an orion fleet that is mining out there an asteroid belt they are really ships that you want to keep on station because why would you want to take them out of there you want them to be churning through rocks and refining them and you know getting that stuff in containers and moving them away from those ships but keep them on the station so Starfarers as a refueler is always going to be a really useful ship, just right now the current interior is absolute horseshit. So really no better way to put it, it's really really bad. And then we have the Reliant series which is the MISC's uh, like semi-starter-ish option. And honestly they are, when it comes to all of these starter ships in this category, they're my least favourite of all of them. They're insanely large which makes them a really large target. They are of course like uh, twin crew, so you can get uh, play around with a friend. But then again, there's so many better ships out there than the Reliance series, so not a recommendation for my part. Now I think today we're gonna end latest on in the Hollow Suite because that's where the most interesting ships are. So let's just go. Uh, we take half of the hall here, so we go Prospector, then we go to the Freelancers, and then we'll move over to the other side, and then we go to the Hollow Suites. So starting off Prospector, single person mining ship, very very capable, an incredibly good earner for a solo player and also in smaller groups these things can still be very useful. Their main, ta tar pff, sorry. Their main target of course is going to be the high value rocks. These are the ships that want to go after the things that actually matter and carry a lot of value. A lot of people use it right now, for example to mine Quantanium with it which is a really profitable mining endeavor. But you also of course have the classics like Laronite and things like that. So those are the kind of things that you go after with a prospector. What it does mean is that you look in often as way was like you wanna really upgrade it. Like there are mining gadgets out there of course, which you can use. But then again, you need to go out of your ship. You need to apply them manually. That takes a lot of extra time. Ideally you want to be able to just stay inside your ship and just crack all the rocks that you come across. So definitely you need some upgrades in the game, but once you have that, 
it is going to do a very good job and you're gonna make a lot of money with it so with that said let's go ahead and take a look at the freelancers i love myself some freelancers even though i don't currently own any of them they are in my opinion one of the better uh you know starter ship upgrades like mid-tier level like it's for a lot of people that want to spend a little bit more money you're really looking as i said before as well in other um, shows it's like freelancer cutlers and of course the spirit series and of those the freelancer has my definite recommendation over all of them so yeah just a cool cool looking ship in many ways um this is gonna be one of those ships that's gonna be relatively iconic i think in the first just a lot of people will be flying them especially people that are just going solo or twin crewing for them for example these ships just have a capability package that is unmatched at this price point and that is just why they are such a strong option now as i said the dirt to me is not really a recommendation because we don't really know how it's going to work out with a lot of exploration stuff but who knows it may come out and be a really strong contender after all I will just say with all of the things sticking out of it, it is by far the least pretty of the freelancer uh, options. The Max, of course, is being a really, really good uh, cargo hauler. It has a <laughs> really healthy amount of capacity in that thing, and it's a very chunky uh, ship in that regard. But if you want to get going out there and haul some good cargo internally, this is a really good option. Like This is an ideal ship that's just hauling cargo from moons to planets and stuff like that. And I said the miss, of course, just missiles, missiles. And would you like some more missiles? Because I have some more missiles. Yes, I know, I still have more missiles. This ship has a immense amount of uh, missile capacity. And that's why it is such a good option to have. So if you need in a fleet and you're like, why do missiles matter? It's all about applying pressure. Like it's probably may not get all of the kills because people will be dodging the missiles will be deploying countermeasures but they cannot ever relax because there's always missiles flying around the place and missiles of course when they do impact they pack a really hefty punch and when something packs a really hefty punch it's also something you consider when you want to engage uh, a fleet that has for example a misc around it so you have a smaller cargo convoy or maybe just a small mining operation having one or two of these flying around the place it does give one pause it's like okay i could engage but it could cost me my ship because there's a lot of missiles that are going to be fired at me there's chances that i'm not going to dodge all of them now of course missiles themselves may be relatively expensive if you're going to be firing a lot of them but they're still a lot cheaper than ships are so this is in quite a few ways it also acts as a very good deterrent uh, for any engagement so yeah the freelancers Honestly, you cannot really go wrong with any of them. It is just that right now, the Dur doesn't really have any particular role, but the others all do. So you can always upgrade it later whenever the exploration comes in. I'm sure it will be available in full once again. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the chunky refining, or not refining. Well, I think they were supposed to refine all the fuel. I'm not sure that's even still in there. At least refueling ships. Of course we have the Gemini and its standard version. The Gemini being the military version, it has a lower capacity, but it brings additional armor and additional firepower, which to me is utterly pointless. Again, this is a support ship. A support ship should not be on the front lines. It should be well protected in the back lines. So it's not a ship that should be anywhere near danger, uh, realistically speaking. So to have additional armor on it and additional firepower, and especially like we're bringing it with missiles and things like that, you just like it doesn't make much sense to me. So if you're gonna buy one of these ships, definitely just buy the standard. It has the higher capacity, and it will do the same job when it comes to what matters, which is refueling. That's all that this thing wants to do. Uh, if you just want to be refueling your fleet, whether it's the smaller fighters or the larger capital ships everything in the game is going to be needing fuel and a lot of the time if you can get refueled while on station that is going to be very much of benefit it's of course the reason why uh, the larger militaries especially focus a lot on refueling 
because it just means you can keep your assets where they are actually needed instead of flying back and forth from a base to their station area which is a lot of wasted time and it can of course mean wasted time in dangerous as in i don't have my combat assets ready but it can also mean wasted time as in i'm not making any profit because i'm flying large ships around while i could just be flying one ship around with the fuel and then maybe one or two other ships to bring the cargo back and forth but that means that i can keep all of my actual assets that are doing the work for like for mining they're just keep staying on station they're not leaving like the orion doesn't leave until the belt has been completely knocked to pieces so yeah that's there and we have the reliance so yeah, as i said they are not my recommendation for a ship some of them had like some future interesting roles like the camera version which could really be interesting like don't get me wrong but they're so large they're rather clumsy not the cheapest not the most capable actually for most of the roles so yeah in really just in short regardless of the variation is i cannot recommend these ships there are just much better options out there for you like the cutter can of course came in you still have the classic titan which is remains and always will remain just a really good solution so yeah the reliance series it's just not a ship i can recommend it it lacks the capabilities that it really needs and honestly when it comes down to the starter market of course that has been completely overshown now by the cutter when it comes to just a value perspective so here of course we have the whole a series the smallest of the holes it moves some cargo but as i said like when it comes to really moving cargo i like other ships more that said if you want to be moving the containers around which this of course going to carry the full-size containers around that may be a benefit for this ship to be um, flying around later on when we have to deal with the full on cargo system which of course we don't know yet but for me the main value for the whole series is going to be the whole c and up and primarily the d and e and i believe the e is a whole limited ship which is of course they are very expensive but then again they are giant container ships so they are pretty much worth their money uh, when you just come down to it they're expensive but yeah you're gonna move so much cargo it's worth it and they're not ships that you're gonna be flying like the larger ones you're not flying that solo you want to have even in safe space you want to have some sort of an escort with those ships and probably also a crew so keep stick in mind the racer series my personal favorite of the racing ships it is a little bit ridiculous with all of the jotty arrow bits which are utterly pointless of course but it makes it for an interesting design which sometimes does really matter honestly for me as i said i like them they're slightly different sort of styling of course than the rest of the mystic ships but it makes sense because it is a dedicated racing ship you have the standard one which is the one i would recommend for racing because it is just the racing ship we have the luxury version which is the one you want to buy when you want a fast ship but you're not planning to race and then we have the stealth version which i guess could be used as a sneaky interceptor or something like that i'm really not sure how they see the role of this thing in the first we have racing ships relatively expensive for what they are but a unique role and racing stuff in general is just more expensive so that sort of makes sense i would not recommend any of them for combat operations righty now we have of course the big boy the endeavor it supports up to six of those pots um, that are available they're available in a wide range now one of the reasons i would say that this thing is a recommendation is if you're running an illegal operation i cannot think of a better drug farm than the endeavor with a whole bunch of hydroponic spots and a single <laughs> and that's about it because <laughs> it is mobile which means you can just put it on cruise turn the engines off just let it keep on cruising out into nowhere and who's gonna find you nobody nobody's gonna find you so you can just keep it resupplied 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 and the only time you would really need to come out of there is when you need to go and do some overhaul on the ship but for the rest of the time it is just entirely capable of being out there you don't even need the fuel because you're literally just having it drift into space outside of sensor range of just about anything i think that can be a really really profitable little endeavor if you are looking for some endeavorous drug dealing 
Beyond that, of course, the science gameplay could become really interesting, but we just don't know how it's gonna come in. That said, at a price point, I still think it's a really good price point, like 350 just for the base design, and of course then the pots need to be added on top of that. Which, depending on which ones you get, can be, you know, up for like three, four, five hundred dollars or something like that. So overall, it gets to be relatively expensive, but it is a really large ship. And it's going to be a really capable ship and it's going to be a really flexible ship that's going to be useful for a wide range of organizations i will not recommend this ship however if you're running anything less than a small organization because yeah you want to have at least some support for this vessel if you no matter how you plan to use it uh, maybe if you only use it purely as a science platform you can get away with just you no know, the crew on itself but it, it's relatively defenseless so that's something to Definitely keep in mind. Our little refiner. As we said, like definitely useful. Um, smaller mid-level organization, not for um, small groups. So not if you're just playing with a couple of friends, then you really probably are looking more towards getting, you're better off getting additional mining assets than to get a refining assets. You need to have, you know, enough mining assets that you can keep the refining asset operating constantly. If you cannot keep it operating constantly, at that point you're better off getting additional mining assets. Keep in mind, of course, if you have one of these, you probably also want to have a transport asset that can remove the weight and stuff from it, so it all comes into play and adds up. But at 150 bucks, it is really quite good, and it being a dedicated ship is a benefit in my opinion. Yes, and there we have it, of course, in the other sea. I mean, I love the design of this thing. I really, really do. As I said, it is relatively expensive. It's cool, something a hundred bucks more than a Carrack. But you can say a lot of things about it. It has its it has a range advantage over the Carrack because it can just refuel itself by mining the containium. And having that larger hanger on there um, means you can have a high degree of flexibility in how you want to approach your exploration. Because you could, for example, park a prospector in there and just mine additional other stuff that you want to do. Or you can use it more for a um, smaller ship to just go down to planet. So you don't need to bring your big bulky there and you can get some people down there. Alternatively, maybe you're like, hey, this place could be dangerous. I'm going to park a combat ship into there. Like if you have one of these things and you're like, oh, people are like, oh, it's just an Odyssey. And then some, and then suddenly you're like an F8 jumps out of that hangar and you're like, oh. Shit, <laughs> yeah, it's really one of my favorite uh, exploration ships that is out there. Like, I r really respect the Carrick, and I do think that these two ships will fill slightly different roles. So, the Carrick is really good, I think, at going to be at the jump weight mapping. Well, as this thing is just going to be uh, better at just staying in system and surveying, and perhaps we'll have to wait and see, of course, how that gameplay turns out. For now, if you want to have either of these ships, like I said, if you get the Odyssey, you get a Carrick as a loner, I'm fairly sure. So that's one way to look at it. Of course, you're paying slightly more for an Odyssey than you would do for a Carrick. That said, the Odyssey is still in a concept stage, which also means that the price is bound to at least go up slightly. Like, it is a recent concept, so with recent concept, the price bumps are a lot more reasonable to say. So I don't think it's going to go up a lot, but it will still go up some. So yeah, if you're really keen on having one, you can just get one. And if you, after all, you're like, eh, you know what? I prefer the Carrick. You can always go back to the Carrick. So something to keep in mind there, but definitely a ship that I can recommend for the role that it does. And here, as we said, the whole series, the big boys. Now, this is the sea. Uh, this is where it starts to get interesting for the hulls. Anything below that, not really that interesting. But here we start to, okay, now we're our moving cargo. And that's what you want to be doing. Like, you want to be moving bulk cargo. That's what these ships are for. And my god, they can move the most cargo of anything. Like, it's, nothing is going to come close to these things. They are, of course, going to be extraordinarily vulnerable. So you will see probably these ships primarily operate within the safer areas of space. Because if they go out where it's more dangerous, these things are just... Like, even with an escort, they are at a really high risk. So if you're gonna go into deep space with these things where there's no, like, level of security, and you bring in your own, 
you're really going to be flying these things in a convoy with a lot of heavy escorts. And of course, because of the value of the goods that they will be carrying, even if it's low value goods, but simply because of the bulk of it, they're going to be a prime target for any pirate level of organization. But they will make you a absolute shit ton of money. They are, however, as I said, these, by the way you described them, these are ships for at least a medium level organization and probably larger ones. If you want to look at operating these things with just a couple of people, you're pretty much sticking to core UEE space, perhaps, on well patrolled shipping lanes. Then you can definitely get away with it. If you're looking at that over being like, oh, I'm going to be a trader, there's one thing you need to keep in mind. You'll need a lot of money to fill this thing up yourself. So if you're going to be buying and selling. So do expect that you're going to be probably running a lot more like a courier style service. So you just go there and pick things up and move it somewhere. So you simply get paid for transporting the goods. So a good smart captain is probably going to be planning their routes out where they do a lot of that. And then they use their additional, their own cash to make trades in between those stops wherever possible. That's how you can uh, increase the profitability of a vessel like this. And it's fairly similar, like how captains used to do it with in the age of sail, and they would just buy like their responsibility was to move the main cargo, but they had like a small section that they were allowed to use for themselves. So that was an additional way for themselves to, you know, increase their earnings. And that's how you want to be increasing your earnings as well, when it comes with to the uh, Misk Hull series. So yeah, overall, like Misk has a really, really strong lineup of a good range of money-making vessels, vessels to go out there into the depths of space, racing, even a little bit of combat, and of course, supporting vessels, which can be used for both a industrial and combat operation. Overall, one of the more interesting manufacturers, the styling is a little bit of an acquired taste for some people, but I really think that they are a nice option and a Overall, a solid recommendation uh, for their lineup, with the exception primarily going to be in the form of the Reliant series, which is just like, it's just eh. Really, it's just eh. And it's really hard to get a good good ship at those low value uh, prices to compete with what we already have out there. So I don't entirely blame them for it. And yeah, that has been it for today for Musashi Industrial and Starflight Concern. I hope that has been useful for you in getting some ideas on what you should buy and what you shouldn't buy. I definitely say like this is one of those days where there's a lot of interesting options out there for a lot of people. Uh, that whether you're flying solo to larger organizations, combative, industrial, so very, very good to always look at MISC. Never overlook them. With that all said, I would like to thank you very much for watching and we'll see each other again tomorrow, which is going to be RSI, of course, which means we're going to see the new Galaxy class, which could be a very interesting vessel indeed.